The rebirth of Tudor has taken the industry by storm, and more than anything else, whether you love them or hate them, it is phenomenal to see how well they have grown in such a short period of time. It just goes to show that when you are born into a family of means with a silver spoon in your mouth, you can make a big splash. Rolex have helped inflate Tudor, who have arrived in a position where they are in competition with the likes of Breitling and Omega, two brands that have been around far longer and have more experience. But regardless, Tudor has reached a point now where they could be considered independent. They are not holding Rolex's hand anymore, per se, but they are still on the end of its tether. Whatever the crown says, the shield follows, and up until this point, the relationship has been more than beneficial for both. There are a few reasons why Tudor is a fantastic watch for your money, and I will be listing them in this discussion. But there is one aspect that is never truly spoken about that I believe gives Tudor an opportunity to one-up its older sibling. And I like the word overthrow because it sort of ties into Wilsdorf's image of the monarchy and what he aspired for his watches. What are the advantages of modern Tudor watches today? The list is almost endless. It is important to note that the newer generations of pieces have been made with exceptional attention to detail. Their finishing is excellent, and the materials and technologies used make them all the more competent pieces of machinery. There is a driving passion to create watches that harken back to vintage-inspired Rolex pieces, and Tudor has a great understanding in this area, introducing watches that are intelligent amalgamations of both camps, modern and vintage. Just a handful of aspects that I appreciate on their watches are the uses of aluminium bezel inserts with coin edging to the bezels, boxed sapphire crystals, simple fonts and typefaces throughout, dials that are relatively spare of text, the ingenious clasp concepts with systems that cater for expanding wrist sizes, and their build quality that comes very close to Rolex's, their choice of colours, the new in-house movements. I could go on for days talking through the elements, and by the end of this discussion you will understand the underlying theme. Let's get the basics out of the way and regurgitate what every other watch reviewer talks about when they discuss Tudor in retrospect to Rolex. Three key points. Where the majority of Rolex sports watches are now artificially unavailable for purchase, Tudor watches generally are a lot easier to get your hands on. So that means then that Tudor watches are more attainable. Tudor has an edge when it comes to attainability. Where Rolex pieces are expensive and hurt when you purchase them, Tudor watches are a lot more affordable. They have an edge when it comes down to affordability. And I will add that they offer a much better value proposition when you consider the quality of watch that you are buying relative to the amount of money that you are spending. And finally, resale. Tudor watches do not lose their value as much as others, which is fascinating when you think about it. For the most part, they retain their value when it comes to selling the pieces off. So in a nutshell, they are extremely competent, they are easy to find, they are affordable when it comes to buying them, they offer immense value, and when it comes to selling them, you can get your money back. It's a win-win scenario wherever you look at it. Now, let me appeal less to the rational side of the brain, and more to the heart of the watch buyer. Here is a bit of a paradigm shift. Where does Tudor have another great advantage over Rolex? They always have been a brand known for their quirky nature, being a more playful sibling, and so they have been given an opportunity that may have been disregarded at first, but now puts them in one of the best strategic positions of the two. Freedom. And in a broader sense, freedom of creativity. The freedom to design. Tudor now has the opportunity to express their thoughts and concepts further than Rolex ever could. And this is partly because of how modern Rolex has positioned themselves as being very stern, even frigid when it comes to creating newer editions of their pieces. For the most part, they incrementally improve their watches, but never go wild. That, in part, is linked with the image that they are trying to uphold. But at the same time, there is a method in the way that they make their watches, which ultimately improves their probability of selling. You see, if they keep the pieces simple, fairly sterile and plain, they appeal to a larger audience. And of course, the name is an excellent selling point, but keeping the watches basic also helps them strategically. I can give you an example of this very briefly when looking at the Submariner and how it has developed over the years. For the most part, the watch is known to come in black, but then on the off chance you might find the model in blue or green. If we now look at the offerings from Tudor, you too have the standard black version, which also comes in various sizes, but then you find blue models, bronze, gold, burgundy, and if you're lucky, green. There is a lot more variety, many more choices, but also experimentation between the different styles of watches. Just spending some time looking at what Tudor offers, they have a large portfolio. And being able to draw inspiration from vintage pieces creates openings for the company to make virtually anything they want. Of course, not all of these watches appeal to people. 
and looking at the case of the Black Bay P01. This is an excellent example of a watch that no one asked for, but Tudor was willing to launch it. In an earlier video, I talk about this watch at length. More than anything else, yes, I agree it is strange, but at the same time, it offers so much opportunity for creativity. Instead of seeing it at face value, I look at what the watch could be, and it is a clear example of an outlet for the brand. I look at the release of the two-tone Black Bay chronograph that plays off the heritage of the Rolex Paul Newman Daytona, specifically the John Player Special, and I think it is a stunning looking watch. There is such a striking contrast between the gold of the subdials and the black of the bezel, paired with a two-tone bracelet. The rivets are a nice touch, again harkening back to the vintage aesthetic. Personally, I would adjust the hour hand to match the minute hand, but overall it is another example of a company being creative with their license. And then looking at the Heritage Chronograph and how it virtually mirrors the Tudor Monte Carlo, you have to admit that it looks like an exciting watch, even if you aren't a fan of it. Tudor watches, in a word, can be described as fun. But then when scrutinizing them, they have become so competent that they are scaring their competitors. It is an excellent place to be situated, having the position of power while also being free to create what you want. As a person who appreciates watches, but also appreciates creativity and a creative approach taken, I admire Tudor. In most situations, they take the brief and run with it, bringing ideas forward that are either appreciated or shrugged off and started again. This is why I put Tudor watches in the same category as Omega when it comes to being a brand that is not afraid to try new things. Tudor as a brand has assumed the mantle of what vintage Rolex aims to be, creating reliable watches for the everyday man. But with the added twist of being able to develop their ideas further, now with their own movements and their own departments, the future of the brand is brighter than ever. As a brand that was seen as the poor man's Rolex, they sure have shrugged off that stereotype.